In this video, I'll discuss the history of machine learning datasets in natural language processing, which I'll refer to as NLP, and briefly define concepts like tree banks, corpora, tokens, and tags. Don't forget to smash the like button for the YouTube algorithm and be sure to subscribe. What happens for most people in language learning is that they run around in circles forever in a metaphorical forest without ever making their way out. Our goal here at Glossika is to deliver fluency efficiently. This means finding the short path between point A, where you currently are in that dense forest of language learning, and point B, an exit point defined as fluency. The way we deliver this solution is a three-step process. Analyze, sort, and deliver. Most of this video discusses the first step, analysis. First, let's discuss tokens. Custom and customs are both tokens of the word custom. In other words, Custom is the base word that may have several morphological representations, depending on grammar and context. All of those known changes of the base word are individually called tokens. An NLP program that lists all of the tokens of a text automatically is called a tokenizer, and these can be found included in Python packages. Or you can do this with a simple regular expression, which I always call regex, in a simple text editor using match and replace. For example, if you're working in the text editor Sublime, you can do this in a matter of seconds without needing to install Python or learning how to code. I'll teach you how to do it. In Sublime, open, find, and replace, or hit Control H in Windows. Make sure regex is turned on, and I always keep case sensitivity on. Type backslash w, open parentheses, dot, clean star, question mark, closing parentheses, backslash, capital W, and in the replace, type in backslash n backslash one, backslash n. Hit replace all or the keyboard shortcut, control, alt, enter. And you'll get every token listed, one per line, with all punctuation deleted. To get a unique list in alphabetical order, let's first change all uppercase letters to lowercase letters. Using Sublime, open the find and replace again using control H. Type open parentheses, backslash u, closing parentheses. And in the replace field, type backslash L dollar sign, which stands for string, one. That's backslash L dollar sign one. And then hit replace all. Now go to the edit menu, select permute lines and unique. Then hit F9 to sort the whole list alphabetically if you want. The process of tokenization basically just shows you all of the tokens in a given text. But it is quite limited. It doesn't show you multi-word expressions, which I call MWEs, or named entity recognition, which I call NERs, for which you would have to build a dictionary. However, while doing NLP, what we really want most of the time are the lemmas. So what we need to do is lemmatization. The lemma of the word customs is the base word custom itself. So lemmatization figures out the base word of any declined or conjugated word in the text. Most search engines and most AI always do lemmatization because the conjugated and declined forms of words usually contain redundancies that are not important for AI to complete its job. Lemmatization, like MWEs and NERs, require dictionaries or datasets that are called upon within Python packages. So we cannot do this directly using regex. Most datasets included within publicly available datasets are not comprehensive, and they vary widely from language to language. They don't handle MWEs very well at all. MWEs are very important for handling compound nouns and phrasal verbs in English. Compound nouns are usually written as a single word in languages like German, so nouns are easy to process in German. However, German and the rest of the Germanic languages are rife with split phrasal verbs. So analysis of verbs often fails miserably across all of these languages, which also happens to include English. The best way to make sure that limitization is working properly is to test the dataset against a complete dictionary. We've done this on medium-sized dictionaries that include phrasal verbs and found that all publicly available limitizers fail on a significant portion. We've also tested lemmatizers on words that aren't found in the dictionary. For example, plurals of uncountable nouns, adverbial forms, past tenses of nouns used as verbs, and found that lemmatizers tend to fail in most of these edge cases. In fact, this is where machine learning can do a better job. This gets to be challenging on highly agglutinative languages, 
like the Central Asian Turkic languages, where machine learning is really the only way. And there are different ways to do lemmatization. For example, to customize, customizes, customization, customize, map back to custom, the original base word, or to their base verbs and base nouns respectively. Do we consider customize equivalent to customize and use one standard? Or do we treat every dialect as its own standard and then correct spelling in each standard where appropriate? How do you deal with this with languages like Serbo-Croatian or the spoken forms of Arabic? The second concept is tagging. In other words, annotation. The gold standard is the pen tree bank, which I'll refer to as PTB from now on. Here's an example sentence. Terry slash S, new slash VP, the slash NP, person slash NP, who slash SVAR, through slash VP, the slash NP, ball slash NP. One thing to notice about these tags is what they are actually representing and how many of them there are. Are they specific to English syntactic phenomena only? In other words, are they specific to the surface structure of one particular language? Or do they encompass a deep syntax that can be applied across a whole family of languages or even multiple language families? Do the tags mark specific data like tense, aspect, and mood? Are they specific to fusional or agglutinative languages? And can the tags become ambiguous in order-free grammars and context-free grammars? Do the tags reveal anything beyond syntax, perhaps some semantic detail as well? The fewer tags you use, the easier it is to tag a larger number of sentences, and the easier it is to train machine learning. This is a kind of classification problem with many possibilities known as a clustering problem. The greater the number of tags, the more complex the analysis becomes. If you've ever been presented with a puzzle on the internet that asks you to click on the pictures that have a bus in it, you've been helping train supervised machine learning algorithms for self-driving cars. The third concept is corpus, the plural of which is corpora. A corpus is a collection of sentences, preferably already tagged. We always prefer rich data sets that have millions of sentences in a corpus. The tagged corpus can then be made into a tree bank. Tree banks show the relationship and structure of all the parts of a sentence to each other. Let's dig into the history of tree banks and corpora for a moment. The brown corpus was tagged in 1964 using 179 tags on 1 million words of English. The IBM tree bank was the next biggest breakthrough in 1986 with 2 million words of English using 166 tags. Then came the Penn Tree Bank, or PTB, in 1993, with 4 million words, using a much smaller set of 47 tags. PTB was originally a $10 million DARPA proposal to tag 100 million words over a period of 10 years. But that didn't pan out as they had hoped. The other thing to note here is that PTB was set up to be a surface tagged dataset of English. PTB has gone on to tag other languages since, but they are all tagged at a surface level. And this creates a massive bottleneck in linguistic scalability. There really is no plug and play with PDB tag sets when it comes to languages. By reducing the number of tags and sticking with a very easy to tag surface English representation to tag ratio, the linguists who developed the PDB tags turned to their housewives who sat in the lab for a couple of years tagging this 4 million word data set. The advantage of this reduced and very close ratio is that the housewives were able to produce 1,500 tagged words per hour. But with speed, this meant that the resulting data set was rife with errors as well. But PTB went on to become the gold standard in industry. Few people question it or even bother to look under the hood. Google Scholar now returns over 25,000 citations to PTB. And several well-known technologies were and are still being trained on PTB such as Google Translate, TensorFlow, Android Voice, Siri Voice, Amazon Alexa, and OpenAI. Linguistics the science, which covers syntactic and semantic frameworks, has come a really long way since 1993, just like all other sciences. In fact, I bet that if you were to look at machine learning datasets applied to other industries, you'd be hard-pressed to find anybody using datasets from almost 30 years ago. In almost all industries except NLP, Datasets are modern and based on the most recent advances. In other words, all of the known modern technologies that use language at its core are based on a 30-year-old dataset that was used to tag billions of sentences across a wide range of various corpora. 
Is there any wonder why OpenAI requires 175 billion parameters and almost a year of computation on one of the world's most expensive supercomputers just to produce results? And its most recent release is actually a frozen moment in time prior to the pandemic hitting. You can also acquire the PTB dataset from the Linguistic Consortium for a little nice hefty fee, along with a myriad of other datasets available there. Or you could go with one of the largest providers of industry-specific datasets in the world, the Australian-listed company Appen. Now let's take a look at the difference between a surface and a deep tagging framework. Here at Glossica, we use a deep tagging framework with 80 tags, about double the amount used in PTB. These tags have been tested against accusative and ergative grammatical frameworks of Western and Eastern languages, African languages, Oceanic languages, Australian, South American, and sign languages, including polysynthetic, agglutinating, isolating, and fusional structures. The resulting tag set, in other words, is a list of the primary elements required in communicating an event that can be observed or described by a living entity, whether human, animal, or intelligent technology. In other words, this tag set represents a linguistic table of elements. Our tagging system splits nouns into various categories, such as agent, committative, experiencer, and so on. So our nouns are never marked subject or object, as these are ambiguous and specific only to the grammars of a subset of languages that require that framework. Let's compare a PTB tagged sentence with a Glossika tagged sentence. The sentence we just saw, Terry knew the person who threw the ball. Terry slash experiencer, knew slash evidentiality, the person slash agent, who slash focus, through slash stative verb causative, the ball slash theme. In this case, there is an experiencer of sensing and cognitive verbs, which when attached to another clause become evidentials. In Glossika, such compound sentences only have a single core verb. In this case, the verb through and adjuncts like knowing this fact or person is treated as an evidential. The main difference between the PTB and the Glossika tags is that the PTB tags are highly dependent on the original word order of the English sentence, whereas the Glossika tags can stand alone as an unambiguous encryption of the real world event that also has an English translation or a translation in any language. In fact, we can now apply reduction and permutation of these tags using binary sequences, which reveal the exact sentence pattern of all the components of that sentence as compared to other sentences. From this, we can determine the exact complexity and level of difficulty for this sentence for anybody who is learning a language. The PTB tags mislead us into thinking that this sentence is very simple in structure, with just a few VPs and NPs and a subclause introduced with SVAR. However, there is no indication of an agent or causative action in the sentence. Even if we were to apply a semantic analysis of the sentence, it still does not reveal these important relations clearly enough. At Glossika, when we take thousands of sentences and filter them for already learned tokens, which is dependent on each individual user's experience with the language, and then sort the binary reduced syntactic analysis, we're not only able to group sentences by sentence patterns that group all varieties of grammatical patterns across the world's languages, but we are also able to sort those sentences by complexity and difficulty. In a future video, I'll discuss the concept of knowledge kerneling using the linguistic table of elements, which has a parallel in chemistry, mixing and combining the chemical elements into larger compounds. Thank you for watching. Don't forget to smash the like button and hit subscribe.